Good afternoon, everyone. Today is December 12th, and we are here again for the Hogs Media Podcast. I'm Garen Wynn. Joshua Moline. Starting off, big transfer portal news for the Hogs football team as we pick up a quarterback. Thoughts, feelings, do you think he's better than what we've had? Yeah, uh, Taylor Green. Yes, right? Boise, Boise State. State. I mean, Boise State has a good team, decent team this year. You know, they won their conference. Um, You know, they're getting getting a decent uh, bowl game. But I'll be honest, like, I don't I don't know if Taylor Green's really the answer. Um, You know, I've heard you you mentioned, you know, offline that people say, don't don't look at the stats, you know, like use the eye test, actually watch some of his games. But. I'm going to go ahead and look at the stats. Uh, completion percentage, 57%. It's pretty mediocre. It's not yes. horrible, but it's definitely not. You know, most most starters in big uh, big five conference schools are 60% or better, you know, so he's he's below what I would consider kind of that, like, threshold. Um, his touchdown to interception ratio, 11 touchdowns to nine interceptions. I mean, he's almost 50-50 on passing touchdowns pretty rough. To, to interceptions. I mean, that's... That's really bad. That's in the mountain. Uh, yes. Yeah. And, you know, running, you know, he's so yardage wise, uh, he has 1700 yards on the season. Uh, he was not the starting quarterback, even for the whole season. There was uh, starting in like October, November, um, Maddox uh, Madsen, the other quarterback at Boise state, he ended up getting actually the majority of the reps during that time. And then it looked like, Maybe Taylor Green got like some of those reps back, like down towards the end of the season. Um, you know, like looking looking at his you know last few games uh, in November, one game he had two attempts. Uh, on the eleventh, he had six attempts. On the eighteenth, he had seventeen, uh, seventeen again, and then fifteen again. Um, so you know, it just kind of makes you wonder, like, you know, if he can't even hold that you know, hold that line against a, a freshman, uh, Maddox, um, who looks like he got injured. And that's why um, he ended up getting that starting spot back in uh, towards the end of November. Yeah, it just it is like, it just kind of worries me. Um, he likes to run, you know, 400. Um, what is it on the season? Uh, 430 running yards on 78 attempts um, with nine rushing touchdowns. Um, so I guess that helps his touchdown to interception ratio a bit, but still we need a passer. <laughs> like we need someone that can pick apart defenses. We saw what KJ can do. KJ is one of the best combo quarterbacks in college football. And I think we're just seeing that that's not what it like, unless you are an elite passer, you can also be a good runner, but unless you carry elite passing status, being a combo quarterback is not, the way to break into the top 15, top 20 teams. Yeah. Unless you're a Lamar Jackson tied player, you can't not be elite at passing. I don't think it's sustainable for wins. And we've seen that with KJ, which this year we've already talked about many times, tough offensive line play, whatever. I I don't know about this guy. I don't watch Boise state, to be honest. I'm not going to pay myself with that blue field, but from what I've seen on his highlights, like you said, he just runs a lot. I didn't see a lot of passing. And everybody's like, well, look at this bomb. He just threw a 50-yard off his back foot. And I'm like, that's great. That's against San Diego State. Can he do that against LSU when Harold Perkins is about to wreck his crap? No. Yeah. So, I don't know if he's being brought in for competition, but everybody on Twitter is going nuts, saying he didn't come here to be a backup. I'm like, well, based off stats and based off the eye test, it's not like he's a guaranteed starter. It's not like a bona fide, we got this dude to be the starter. Nobody's seen what Criswell can really do, and KJ still has yet to announce, but I'm sure soon he will announce he's leaving. Criswell's right. got in game action for three quarters against Missouri against and with a crappy offensive line. So, Trino will obviously see something he likes in green, but I think it's more for competition. We'll go from there. Yeah. If, I mean, it, you know – if KJ does another year uh, and is the starter, then obviously you want to find a replacement that has a similar style. So, I mean, 
could could potentially mean that. But if if KJ is gone, it's like we probably need to find a new style of quarterback. You know, I mean, especially knowing Petrino, like Petrino has made uh, his career from like amazing pocket passers. And there's Even at Arkansas. Yeah, this guy has the height of mallet and all this stuff, but I don't think I ever remember Ryan Mallet having eleven touchdowns and nine interceptions. Yeah. Um, nope. I don't think there's anybody else that has transferred. Tank Booker just recently announced he's leaving, but he's a rotational defensive lineman. Not a huge loss besides depth. Um Poo Paul announced he's going to Ole Miss. So everybody's upset about that. Ultimately, he's got to do what he wants to do. Lane Kiffin's the cool coach. They're going to win nine games, and he's going to get paid. So it's best for his career. Yeah. Other than that, I'm really trying to think of who else entered. Crook announced he's going to Arizona State. Um, that's it. I don't think anybody, really besides who we talked about last week, has entered the portal that's a major player for us. Big news, though, in Armstrong and Tesla coming back. That is huge news for our wide receiver room. Brings back experience. It's another year for them just to get – they're used to the SEC style now. I think it's just going to make them better. Armstrong had a really good season anyways. So I think he can mm-hmm. build off that and get more opportunities, especially in Petrino's offense. I think both of them can. So those were huge yeah. announcements. Yeah, those those are big. I think um... – I think we didn't figure out how to use Tesla, you know, I think so. to his skill set. You know, he's he's tall. You know, he's he's like a contested six, catch five. guy. Yeah, it put him put him more in the slot. Like, let him use his size. Let him use his body. He's not like a downfield speedster, you know, and he's not necessarily that like Calvin Johnson, just like huge big threat either, like a DK Metcalf, you know, like that guy. He's more of a just kind of like almost like edging on what you could get out of like a Travis Kelsey type tight end. Um, so it's like, use like some of that size, let him, you know, find soft spots in the zone, let him find like some quick slants, you know, eight, 10 yard passes. And, you know, th- he had moments this year where we used him for that. But I think there was a lot of times this year where we put him, you know, on the outside and have had him do like outside routes. I think there was times, you know, where we were sending him deep or, or putting him on routes that required like a high level of like quickness and cutting, uh rather than like using like just like size and like finding the soft spots and um so i think i think patrina will help like maximize that you know he could be that like eight yard catch guy every you know every play if he finds the right spots and uh yeah armstrong i i really like armstrong i think is a really versatile receiver um i think he still hasn't hit his potential yet he's got great hands good speed good length and athleticism i mean he's got you know, he's got the potential to be like, you know, kind of the full package, um, you know, kind of reminds me of like, who's our guy, like uh, Greg Childs, you know, like years ago, like maybe something like that. So you definitely get that run after catch yards of catch yak, whatever they call it. He's, mm-hmm. he's shown that capability. I think in Petrino's offense, like you said, he'll get more opportunities to build towards his potential. He's got to find a quarterback, got to find an offensive line. And we've offered a crap ton of offensive linemen in the portal. I don't know the exact number, but we have offered a ton of them. And I think we picked up one, I think. It was early on in the portal, but that's it. I think that's all the news revolving around football. Thoughts about our future performance against Oklahoma for Hogs basketball. Thoughts? Man, I'm worried. Uh, the is it time to panic meter? Um, Lenardi's bracketology came out today, and we are not even in the bubble area, we're not even in the last full like none of that. That's how bad we are out right now, yeah. And, and I'll say, like, from a resume standpoint, like, if the tournament started tomorrow, I agree. We have done, not, we have not won, you know, we've won one good game and that was against Duke uh, at home. Every neutral site game we've won, or we, we beat Stanford in double overtime on They're a neutral a terrible court. Terrible team. Yeah. And then we lost two other neutral courts uh, or three other neutral courts now, you know, and um, lost at home to a mid major. And it's just, 
it's our, it's how we looked in those games. You know, we've, we've talked about it all year, you know, just like lack of flow. We're back down. You know, it looks like our marker for wins versus losses is double digit assists. Yeah. And we can agree with them. get over that double digit assist mark. We tend to win. If we stay under, like we tend to lose. I think you talked about it a couple episodes, our ISO ball tendencies. I think this was the worst example of that. We, our best example, maybe. Um, we did not pass the ball at all, especially first yeah. half. I, I turned the game off eventually. Coach Muss was obviously frustrated as well, as you saw him throw a tantrum. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's just it's, we, it's weird. It's, weird. it's like our the when we do pass, it's without intention. Yes. You know, it's exactly. not, it's not it's passes weird. that that get us closer to the basket or hit the open guy. It's literally just like a lot of guys are just like running around the perimeter, just passing it, passing it, passing it. But like, it's not, it's not good. It's not the kind of passing that you need. It's just movement for the sake of movement. It's not the right movement. Oh, movement like, with intention. Of that. It, movement with intention. The perfect example of that is, you know, when uh, in the second half, we got a shot clock violation or almost got a shot clock violation. Tremont Mark catches the ball, like, deep behind the three-point line with maybe four seconds left he does a little move gets to the elbow and then jumps up and like flings it over to davenport on a bad pass and then davenport's just like catching it up here and like yeah, flinging it with I, I left. It's like okay you passed it those that's just passing for the sake of passing like you had a pretty decent shot with one sec two seconds on the shot clock don't fling it out to a guy who's not set you know on a bad pass with one second to go like like these are the kinds of things, you know, and like battle, like Caleb battle, like dude is super talented, but the number of times he just puts his head down and just goes full speed to the basket through three, two, three, four defenders, and then falls down, you know, he's, he's trying to draw the foul, but he's also trying to avoid contact and, he ends up falling on the ground and then our transition defense is screwed because he's just laying on the ground five feet behind the basket and the other team blocks him and, and takes off. So then our transition D is screwed and he's getting himself injured and hurt and we're losing an offensive possession. So like, dude, like be aware, like you can draw defenders, dribble in with your head up and then find the cutter, find the open guy. Like don't wait, you know, and, and Ellis is kind of doing the same thing, but it looks different Ellis is just trying to like dribble through two or three guys and then getting trapped and then like, you know, passing it, dribbling it off his foot. He dribbled it off him, his or someone else's foot, like multiple times. He just panics and then just throws it and it gets intercepted. Like it's just bad. It's really bad offense and really bad defense. Like we're not, we're not winning on either end. You mentioned think perfectly i think you said it passing with intention you have to have a purpose all coaches say this you got to move with a purpose dribble with purpose pass everything like you said our dribbling is just hey i don't want it here you go you sit a lot hey i don't want it here you go battle you do what you do i so i'll go sit in the corner if you see me hit me that davenport he's a shooter he'll do that Nobody mm -hmm. attacks. L. Ellis attacks sort of with a purpose, but then he gets out of control. He gets that trap, like you said, and then he doesn't know where to go. And then he's stuck doing that. And then ends up with a turnover, a bad pass. And it's just like, we need, like we did in the Duke game, swing it, move, pass, dribble, get to the basket. Like you said, we're dribbling, going nowhere. We got to get a paint touch. Paint touches lead to either baskets, fouls, or kick out threes. Yep. And what we do is we swing it around the perimeter, hoping for somebody to either hit a tough contested three at the end of the shot clock or some or offensive rebound. And like yeah. you said, our defense is screwed every time battle falls and flops. And I know he's getting hit probably, but not no ref is going to call it every single time, especially for Arkansas. It's just not going to happen. Yeah. So every time. Well, no, and, it, and refs, what they'll look for too is like, are you out of control or in control when you go up and draw the contact? Exactly. And half the time he's literally just like running full speed and just doing this. It's like, dude, just cause there's contact, like you're, fl you're flailing all over the place. Like you're not going to bail you out. 
Yeah, like you're clearly just looking for the bailout, not a true like you had the bucket and got hit, you know? And yeah, it's it's tough. Um, I mean, in, in the post-game interview, Mus was like, I mean, I've never seen him like this in five years. You know, he's like, I have no idea what what the deal is with this team. He said, we're probably going to see major personnel changes, even like he, he kind of like started basically say like, guys that you think are like locked in starters might not be playing anymore, <laughs> you know, just cause it's like, it's not effective for the team and the energy, the effort, the discipline, like sticking with the game plan, like all that kind of stuff. Um, On defense. Like, I think like must comes from an NBA background where players uh, have all of the physical attributes you need to be successful and they have an incredible basketball intelligence and i think Mus is expecting our guys to operate all with like a pro level of intelligence and athleticism and i think we're just getting lost and confused because our screen coverage our bigs and and our guards like they just either they don't know what to do and so they're just getting out of position or they they know where they're supposed to be and they're just not athletic enough or quick enough to like get there. But either way, I mean like our on like <laughs> our on ball defense against OU was so bad. We were hedging so hard against the like left hand like left side screen that we were just like opening up wide open lanes to the guy on offense that would just blow right by. And it's like, what are you doing? Like you're hedging so hard for a pick maybe or maybe you think this guy doesn't have a left hand dribble but like it would just blow right past our guys couldn't get backside help and then when the screen did come like they still weren't getting over the top of it very well our big man wasn't creating good coverage it was just like what is happening i don't i don't know what our defensive strategy is mccollum's their best player and he just dominated us like you said they would force him with his left hand and he's just like okay and would drive past our guys every time or he'd kick yeah. it number three unbelievable hit like five threes so he would just kick it to him he wouldn't miss and then they're big guys that one i don't remember his name but there, there's a big old post man he oh would, yeah uh huge i think his name is hugely yeah dj Hughley or something like that hugely <laughs> no but he was a grown man and he showed it he dominated our post guys yeah. In all aspects on defense, we just did not perform well. And our offense is not to that level yet where it can cover up our bad defense as yeah. in the past sometimes. Yeah. If you had your choice, what would you do for personnel? If you were to say, okay, we need to sit this guy more and this guy needs to see more playing time or we should start this guy, what would you do? I would, one – Okay, I'm going to I'm going to throw out some hot takes, but I feel like we need them because we're literally not playing well. So you might hear this and be like, "He's our best player. Why would you do that?" It's like, "Well, we're losing." So something is just, So one, I would not let Mark run point. I he does not run point very well. I don't think. I don't think he facilitates the offense very well. I don't think he gets guys in motion very well. I would force Mark to play a similar type role to like what Audis Tony did a few years ago, where it's like, "You're a slasher, you're a cutter." Obviously, he's got a great shot. Mid range threes. Yeah. And like get him, get him in the mid range, get him like, you know, where he can cut to the basket, but take him off point. Have him stop facilitating the point. Um, I would run more set plays for battle. Um, I think that's part of it, is like, you know, we'll we'll kind of set some screens once in a while, but for the most part, we're the offense that we're running is like telling battle basically, like go win your matchup and it it can be tough. So I would do a lot more like double screens, pin downs, like kind of like reverse, you know, like reverse schemes where he's going from this end all the way over to this end. I mean, he's got a heck of a shot. He doesn't need much space to get a shot. So it's like, let's stop passing it to him when he's got a defender on him and asking him to like jump over a guy to get a shot or try to beat him in the basket. Let's get him off the ball screens. And a lot of that like movement. So I would do that. Um, our bigs, I mean, I still don't uh, – honestly, I've been most pleased overall probably with Jalen Graham. 
yeah. in a limited sample size, but he's His defense was pretty good on Saturday. Defense was decent. Like, and he's, he's at least like, Trying. he's got like active hands, you know, he's got active feet, you know, and he's, he's putting in what looks like more energy and effort. Um, and we know on the offensive side of things, like he can be a threat. I would like try to encourage him to pass a little bit more once he like makes two or three buckets, <laughs> like kick it out. Uh, but he could, you know, pop guys open, you know, by doing that at point, honestly, I still don't know. I mean, when Ellis is on, he's, he's, on. he's a really good point guard, but when he's off, it's really bad. Like his ceiling is, I think is higher than anyone else on our team for point guard, but his floor is shockingly lower than everyone else's like floor at point guard. Um, so I don't know. We need to do something to get his confidence up. Cause I feel like when Ellis is on, like our team's doing well, like the dude can make incredible passes. I mean, we've seen, seen him like hit like cutters back doors. Like we've seen him make some awesome passes. So it, he's got it. He's got the vision for it, but he's just in his head. He's it, We don't know what's going on. And then Devo, I don't know what to do with Devo, man. Like, kid's a feisty defender, but his offense all year has been... I don't know what happened to his shot. Yeah. It just it disappeared. So, like, I, I don't know. Yeah. I would keep... I, I, like, I like the direction da uh, Davenport's heading. You know, I think he's... The good news with Devon is he's gotten better each game, whereas mm -hmm. someone like Ellis has gotten worse each game. Um, so that's good. Um, I think he's starting to finally like feel confident making his shots. He's starting to knock them down a little bit more at the at the percentage that we expected. Um, he's showing a lot of energy. He's showing a lot of like feistiness out there. He can get burned. You know, it's it's not super hard to like burn him off the dribble, but he recovers decent. And he's you know I think he's at least generally like making the right call, making the right read. He's just maybe not quite as quick on the step, you know, to get there, but I don't know. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I think LLS definitely needs to sit. I don't know what he needs to do. Jalen Graham, like you said, I think is the best option. If he can keep his defensive effort and energy out there, I think he's a better offensive threat. So even if he starts and plays three minutes, like Chandler Lawson does, I, I just think he brings more if he can keep up the defensive energy because his offensive game is very good. It always has been his defense and his free throws. Um, Devo, I, like you said, I don't know where his shooting has gone, his offense, even his mid range, which has been his trademark since his freshman year is like kind of gone. So mm -hmm. we need him to at least show up somewhat on the offensive end. Do you start battles? The question you got to start Mark, but like you said, he does not need to be a point guard. He needs to be on the wing away from point guard and Brazil's Brazil. We've said it multiple times. If he shows up, we're a completely different team. You know how much he had against Oklahoma? Zero. You can't I'm have sure his played a part, but yeah, he still you can't have a lottery pick, which he literally was projected last week, score zero in a crucial game. Coaches yeah. talk all the time about when the lights come on, you got to perform it every time. It seems like we don't have a key player to do that. Now, Duke, they showed up. He had a fantastic game. Battle had a good game. Devo was clutch at the end. Mark mm -hmm. was hurt. But when we get to these SEC games that matter, the Kentuckys, the Auburns, the Tennessees, even Ole Miss this year is going to be tough. So mm -hmm. many other teams. Can we have those guys step up, or are we just going to keep up this trend and hope, well, these guys are talented. They'll put it together. Because we're one-third through the season now, and it's like, well, they're going to have to put it together soon, or we're going to be looking at we have to win the SEC tournament to get in. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I would say, like, the majority of the SEC is going to be as good as Memphis, and Memphis took it to us, killed us. They'll be as good, if not better, than UNCG. Like, it's it's not like, yeah, there's not going to be a drop-off in competition from what we've had. Um, you talk about Alabama. Alabama's loaded again. Alabama, yeah, they uh they they almost got one on Purdue the other day. To be states better. Um Texas A M's Texas A M, they always are a tough challenge for us. I mean, there are so many teams this year, like you said, that are good. No drop off. 
going to be better than the teams we've been struggling against in non-conference play. Mm -hmm. I just don't know yeah. what Must does either. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what I I think I think like we'll see what happens, but I wouldn't be surprised, but I would be shocked uh if Muscleman actually changes the system mm -hmm. instead of the players. Um, like part of me wonders if he's gonna like look at enough tape, look at enough like personnel and say, okay, I'm expecting our guys to fit into this kind of system, which is his system, and it can work with the right players. I wonder if he's finally gotten to that point where he's saying, crap, these aren't the players and this system doesn't work anymore. And I wonder if he pivots to more of a like set play type of offense. Obviously not every time down the core, but right now I'd say like, maybe one out of 10 plays are we actually running a set. And then the rest of the time, there's kind of like general rules of like where you're supposed to be. But, you know, there's not like a clear like one option. It's more like, yeah, this guy moves here. This guy moves here. This guy moves here. If the defense does this, it's all about reading the defense, right? Like if they do this, find this guy. If they do this, find this guy. It's complicated, you know, and again, works with high IQ and high athleticism. But I wonder if, I wonder if we see maybe more like, five out of 10, six out of 10 plays being like, no, we're like clearly getting this guy a shot at this spot, or we're going to like get this guy multiple screens to get a drive at this spot and have this guy come back door. And you, you have one option. You either take the layup or you dish it to this guy. And it's not four option offense. Like we could see that we could see a change up in how we do screen coverage. Uh, we might start to see a lot more switching um, we might start to see like a bit more sagging off the ball. Um, Cause I think like part of our problem is like we play really tight man. Mm -hmm. So then uh, when we come to help defense, we are getting all of our momentum inward so that they can kick it outwards and we can't recover in time. If we start basically doing what defenses are doing to us, if we start just a little bit tighter the lanes are going to be clogged up. So it's going to prevent guys from being able to penetrate in the first place. So then if they try to kick it out, we're not having our momentum go the wrong direction. You know, like we can recover a bit quicker than trying to like, you know, suck down and then go back out. So I don't know. We might see like more, a little bit more like saggy defense drops off, drop offs, more switches on picks. And maybe that like helps solve the problem is like decomplicate it, declutter it. And like, I don't know. It's a freedom-based offense, and I think that's part of the issue is that everybody takes advantage of that, and it's not working. So like you said, declutter it, make it more organized, a set offense, like more than – like to go along with the set. It's not set where you have movement intentions and then not just moving to get your best shot. I think he'll definitely look at that. And like you said, defense, I think there's going to have to be some changes. Just the way we guard people, screens, we don't guard screens well at all. So I think that's got to be a major point in practice. And it's tough to tell the progress we'll make when we play Lipscomb. I, I know they're a good team, but it's still tough to go from Oklahoma, okay, we played like this, to Lipscomb, where we might destroy them. It's like, okay, but did we actually show any improvement or is it just – strength of opponent yeah 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 no it's that's a good yeah it's, it's gonna be tough to tell oh OU is definitely the like air tournament the progress game for me you know it's like okay we beat duke at home we yeah. had a lot of energy a lot of fire we had a good you know five days after atlantis let's see what happens so it was like okay good and then you know yeah you couldn't really necessarily tell in our next game uh which was uh Furman was the next one right um, and it was like, okay, like Furman played decent against us, but we looked like we were doing the right things, right? Like they were just hitting shots, but like our defense didn't look out of sorts against Furman and offensively, like we scored a lot in that game. So, you know, it was like 93 or something like that. So it was like, all right, we're doing what we need to do. And against Oklahoma, it just, just went to show like, no, nope, came out flat, we, came out flat. And it's like, I wouldn't be on in panic mode about this team if it was like man we're getting good looks we're just not getting them to fall or 
you know, oh, we're, uh, you know, we're, we're making Oklahoma, making these teams shut, shoot really tough shots. And like, they're just, you know, they're being, they're out aggressing us, you know, like they're just beating us. It's like, no, I'm concerned because like, we just look freaking confused out there. Like it's the shots that we're taking are horrible, like horrible shots with horrible offense and, and they're not falling and defense. So I'm, I'm concerned. Definitely. Um, love this team. A lot of individual great talents. You know, I would take any one of our guys on our team in a one-on-one -on -one game. I wouldn't take them on, but if I had to place bets on any of our guys in a one-on-one -on -one game, I'd pick our guys, but as a team, nope. I'm just not, not getting it. Yes. Um, Volleyball historic season came to an end. Did you get a chance to watch? I did actually. I watched uh, a lot of it. Uh, in fact, it was on uh, ESPN Plus. Yeah, we we uh, should have won the first set. Um, our team got up. Completely changed up, like, the game, in my opinion. Completely changed the yeah. match. As soon as we lost that first set, I was like, it's not looking good. Yeah, that was tough. You know, tough comeback. You know, Nebraska. Hats off to them. I think it was like a. 10 to three run or something like that to end it the was first game. to end it. Yeah. So that's tough. And then, you know, Nebraska got the second set. We got the third one and it looked like we like recapped the, the momentum, momentum of the fourth. We had it, we had it. And then we had a couple service errors, which like those were killer. Have. We had 10 compared to their three. And when they kept bringing up that stat, it's like, why? And we're two yeah. of them were from a designated serve. Like she comes in to serve. It's so frustrating when that happens. And to end the game, too. End the game. It's end the match, so... end the season on a service error. Yeah, that was that was tough. Um, Nebraska had the home crowd, too, you know, which you They're could tell once it team. above 20, you know, when it was 19 to 20, 21, 19, you could tell that it was like, I think the crowds are, like, getting to our girls. Like, their nerves are showing up, and we had – yeah, even in the final five points for Nebraska, I think we had like two service errors, like two out of five. We had the net, which isn't necessarily like nerves, but still just that like little net tap. Oh, that was like was such rough. a bummer. It yeah. was, but in positive news regarding that team, uh, Jill Gillen got drafted second round for a new volleyball professional league that's starting in February. Pro volleyball, I think she's going to Orlando and then Maggie Cartwright. Um, got drafted in the fifth round. I can't remember what team, but that's huge. I didn't even know they had pro volleyball unless it was overseas, but that got posted yeah. on Twitter. So that Amazing. is huge news, especially since Jill Gillen is 5'7", an outside hitter. That is just insane in volleyball. I mean, she was going off against 6'5 girls and still getting it past them occasionally. It's just – we were – we were like that uh, scrappy Cinderella is how I would say we were. And we were, it was definitely David versus Goliath, but it was a great season. I think we can build on it. Yeah. Successful season. Yeah. Of a, program. yeah. That definitely sense. looks good. Yeah. Elite, elite eight, you know, it's amazing. We were the only three seed left in the tournament. Yeah. It was all one and twos. Um, so yeah, great job. Great job, ladies. Uh, go get them next year. Keep building. And it's one bummer day. Well, yeah. actually, women's basketball lost to Pine Bluff. So oh. I don't want to end on a bad note, but I think that needs to be mentioned. That is our bad beat of the week, I think is what everybody says. <laughs> yeah. That is I, I don't think we should ever lose to an in-state team, and especially not in basketball. So that in Arkansas sports news, that was Pretty rough. Basketball overall this week, not a good week. Not a good week. I'm a little sad because over the next 20 days, I think we have a total of like two games. Or yeah, like we play three. Saturday, we play and then I think we play like the next Saturday or something like that. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, we play Saturday. So a whole week from OU to the next game. So a seven-day wait. And then five days after that, we play on Thursday. Oh, okay. And then it's a nine-day break to the following Saturday before oh. we play so, yeah, during that week, we'll have Christmas, of course, uh, and Christmas Eve, and then we play right before New Year's. So, and then it'll be another full week after that before we start conference play. Conference play, yeah. 
which to be fair, because the, so from December 9th up until SEC play starts on January 6th, let's basically just call out a full month. We only have three full games, three, yeah, three games. So after OU, so in a month span, honestly, that's what our, probably what our basketball team needs. He's coached plenty of time to watch film. Plenty of time to watch film and work on ourselves. You know, we don't have to worry about prep right now. We don't have to worry about prepping for the next team. We have to worry about figuring out our crap, figuring out our offense, figuring out our personnel. So I'm, I, even though I'm sad that I don't get to watch, I'll probably just rewatch a lot of games. Cause I always, I, I've watched, I've rewatched every single basketball game twice so far or rewatched it at least once. Uh, so I might do it again just to pass the time, but uh, I am thankful that they have, you know, basically 30 or 28 full days um, yeah. to, to dial it in and, and come back out strong in January. I am too. Yeah. I think that's it for this week. That wraps up the Hogs Media Podcast for this week.